From KCRW, I'm Kim Masters, and this is The Business. As a former high-level Scientologist, Mike Rinder had a window into the close relationship between the group's top man and the top gun. He says there's no doubt that Scientology's biggest star has a clear understanding of the group's dark ways. David Miscavige was reviewing the rushes of Tom Cruise's movies and giving him direction on what to do with them. That is someone who understands the behaviors that are ongoing in the inner sanctum of Scientology. Mike Rinder shares stories from his past and his memoir, A Billion Years, My Escape from a Life in the Highest Ranks of Scientology. But first we banter. Stick around. It's the business from KCRW. I am joined by my colleague in banter, Matt Bellany. Hello, Matt. Hi there. So, you know, we kind of knew that with the proliferation of streaming services and the proliferation of competition and spending on original content and all of that, we've talked about this a lot for a long time now, sooner or later, Gravy Train had to slow its roll. <laughs> and uh, one sign that this is, in fact, happening is Netflix is changing its deal. Netflix was like the comedy special place. Like, that was your dream. It became like the Johnny Carson gig of the era where you got your comedy special and they would pay a lot of money for the comedy special and they would own the comedy special in perpetuity. But Netflix is now backing away from that because, as I say, that's, uh, you know, it's a sign of the times. Absolutely. And there was a Wall Street Journal story this past week that noted that Netflix is now paying people $200,000 for a two-year license of a comedy special rather than these multi-million dollar figures that they were throwing at people to own the special. And that may seem like pretty minor. You know, this is just a comedy special. Like, they're not that big on the service anyways. But what's interesting to me about this is whether this is a canary in the coal mine situation, whether Netflix is going to apply this strategy to other aspects of what it is doing. Because that was the initial Netflix model. When they first got into original programming, they didn't have any desire to own. They just wanted to have things on the platform. So they would license shows like House of Cards or Orange is the New Black or Hemlock Grove. And ultimately, they got into ownership. But now if they are retreating from ownership and saying, you know what, let's just pay a little bit and have this the show on the service for a couple of years and then you can have it back and sell it, that's a big, big change. Or the other piece would be, why aren't you licensing your content? Why aren't you licensing House of Cards to someone? And what good does it do to have it sitting there on your service forever? Well, that's the interesting thing here is, you know, there's a school of thought now that as more of these Wall Street analysts are valuing the profitability of these streaming services, you should be licensing out this old content to generate more money for your service, even though it, the whole proposition of Netflix was it's going to be on the service forever. You subscribe to Netflix. You can watch anything you want that we've ever done at any time. But some of the stuff just doesn't have that high of viewership. So maybe the value is bigger elsewhere. And if Netflix starts having that philosophy, that is a huge change from where they've been, where they just think that they can spend as much as they can on content, they can own it forever, and it's a simple proposition when you subscribe. Yeah, I mean, look, we're just, they're getting close to launching their ads tier, and there's all kinds of speculation about how they'll do that and, you know, what it will look like and how consumers will respond to that. So, yes, Netflix is morphing. I mean, I think they are going to make fewer movies. They're going to they're going to have to cut that spend, whether they want to admit it or not. I don't think they're the only ones. We've seen Warner Brothers Discovery looking to save money. And Disney has always been a little bit on the cheap side as far as uh, unless you're like, you know, one of the top creators in the world. So I think the industry is just swinging the other way now because there's a, a saturation point and there's that's going to be a thinning of the herd, as Bob Iger has recently said, I think kind of stating the obvious. We can't have all these services and they can't all be cranking out originals. It just doesn't work. And I think what we're seeing now is some of the fat being trimmed. I mean, I did a story this past week about Apple ending its relationship with Oprah Winfrey. 
And that was something where they paid a lot of money to Oprah to get her into the Apple TV Plus fold at the very beginning so people would take it seriously. Oprah had a non-exclusive arrangement. She did a lot of stuff for other outlets like Harry and Meghan and Adele. She did for CBS. And Apple ultimately didn't get a ton of value out of that relationship beyond the press release. And it's just not worth it anymore. They'd rather do one-off deals with someone like Oprah if they want to put their money there. But these giant relationships really, ha- they're under more scrutiny now. Yeah, Warner Brothers taking a close look at what J.J. Abrams has brought them. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. That's Matt Bellamy, founding partner of Puck News. Having grown up in a Scientology family, it seemed Mike Rinder was destined to be a Scientologist all his life and beyond. At 18, Rinder joined Scientology's Sea Org, a group of the organization's most dedicated servants. And as Scientology requires, he signed a billion-year contract. Eventually, Rinder was promoted to executive director of the Office of Special Affairs, serving as Scientology's head spokesperson and dealing with some of the organization's highest profile members, including John Travolta, Lisa Marie Presley, and Tom Cruise. In the mid-2000s, Rinder was present during Cruz's increasingly public promotion of Scientology, which included his famously ebullient couch-jumping appearance on Oprah. He also got into a testy confrontation with Matt Lauer on the Today Show. Maybe there are too many kids on Ritalin. Maybe electric shock is... kids on Ritalin? Matt. I'm just saying, but, but aren't there Matt. examples where it Matt. works? Matt, Matt, you, you don't even... You're glib. You don't even know what Ritalin is. If you start talking about chemical imbalance... You have to evaluate and read the research papers on how they came up with these theories, Matt. Okay? That's what I've done. Eventually, Cruz figured out that his very public embrace of Scientology was alienating some fans, and he dialed it back. As for Rinder, he fled Scientology in 2007 and has publicly opposed the organization in film and TV documentaries ever since. He has now released a memoir, A Billion Years, My Escape from a Life in the Highest Ranks of Scientology. We should note that Scientology has condemned Rinder and other defectors as apostates and liars. As you know, I've written about Scientology for a long time, longer than I ever meant to, to be honest. And you were there for some of it. You joined the Sea Org. You signed a billion-year contract, right, to be a member of the Sea Org, which is kind of the upper-level, I don't know, clergy-slash-enforcers of Scientology, would you say? Um, Yeah, that's uh, a pretty good description. I think you broke the billion-year contract, just based on my count. (laughs) But you did sign that at 18, and, uh, yeah, being, I didn't make it all the way through to the end, that's for sure. <laughs> you didn't get to renew. Uh, <laughs> and then you served. And as your book details, you got into this very high-level part of Scientology and suffered enormous, um, you allege, enormous abuse at the hands of David Miscavige, and, you know, who is now the successor to L. Ron Hubbard, the leader of Scientology. But basically, in Scientology, I mean, first of all, if you're in Sea Org, you, you are what they call on post 24-7, meaning you have no life of your own, right? That's, you're a creature belonging to this organization. It's kind of a yes, naval, exactly. it, it, L. Ron Hubbard had a thing for naval things. And so you had a sort of a uniform that you were supposed to wear? Yes. And it looks just like a U.S. Navy uniform. And people have ranks in the sea organization, just like in the Navy. You start as a swamper and you ultimately work your way up through midshipman and ensign and lieutenant and all the way up to captain. So, yeah, the sea org and the reason for the billion years, Kim, just so that people who are unfamiliar with this kind of understand, is you are, Scientologists believe that you live more than one lifetime and a billion year, quote, contract, unquote, because it's really not a contract, obviously. You can't contract <laughs> someone to, for a billion years, but it's called a Sea Org contract. And the billion years is I am committing myself to achieving the aims of Scientology, not just in this lifetime, but for all eternity. And yes, but you do get a 21-year break when you're reborn for to grow up and then in join theory, the yes. In theory, not, <laughs> not that anybody has ever actually made a return engagement to the Sea Org, but that's the well, um, to say. that's the I sort mean, of theory. <laughs> we don't know. 
<laughs> well, okay. So in Scientology also, just as a sort of a fundamental thing, if something goes wrong in your life, as I understand it, it is your fault. You're doing Scientology wrong. Correct. Not only are you doing Scientology wrong, you have done something bad that has caused that to happen to you. Yes. You have done a bad thing that must be ferreted out. And I think most people know that there's uh, auditing in Scientology, where, and, and that as a just as a foundational thing, if you enter a Scientology, you are supposed to confess everything wrong you've ever done in your life, which means, of course, that Scientology then has quite a dossier on everything you either did wrong or think you did wrong. Yes, that's correct. And just to be totally 100% accurate, it's not just everything you did wrong in this life. It also <laughs> extends back to earlier lifetimes that you may have done something wrong. And let me just explain this because it's a very important point. And, you know, I talk about it a lot in the book, this idea that the Scientology term for it is you pulled it in. You created the bad circumstance that you are in because you did something bad that caused you to receive something bad. And when you are in Scientology, you're interrogated using this e-meter thing, which is sort of like a lie detector. And it's a unshakable truth in Scientology that if you got, you know, hit by a car, then that means you hit someone with a car and you have to go back and find that incident and confess to it. But if you've never driven a car, you're 16 years old, you've never even driven a car yet. Obviously, you can't find an incident where you drove a car. So you start going into past lives where you, you know, ran over someone with a stagecoach or you you squashed someone with a chariot back in Roman times or, you know, whatever. And the e-meter and the person who is operating the e-meter sort of guide you, you know, that's the Scientology way of putting it. They guide you to coming to an understanding of what these horrible things are that you may have done previously that caused you to now get run over by a car. or in the instance of myself, that caused David Miscavige to punch you in the face. What did you do that caused that to happen? Not what's wrong with David Miscavige. It's what did you, Mike Rinder, do that caused you to receive that bad thing? Yes. Now, when I started covering Scientology, there was, <laughs> dating myself, there was no internet. And so leaving Scientology the people who left were very isolated. They, you know, it was much more difficult, I think, for them to find each other. And I was given at the beginning a sheet uh, that the fallen away Scientologists handed to reporters like me, basically telling you how to protect yourself from Scientology, because there was this thing, I think it's called fair game, meaning you, whatever you do to an enemy of Scientology is justified. And, and there were, I mean, in, it, before my time, even, there were some terrible things done to reporters, or allegedly, I should say, done, uh, who were trying to look oh, into Oh, you don't need to say allegedly, Kim. Yeah, there were yeah. terrible things that were done to reporters and many other people. I mean, there was a prosecution in 1977 of L. Ron Hubbard's wife and 10 other leading Scientologists for right. doing absolutely horrible things to people. Yes. So... You don't have to say a legend. Right. Uh, well, what I should true. say, I guess, right now is that Scientology has said that they don't do that stuff anymore, <laughs> or that that was a breakaway bad group, and that wasn't them and isn't them, and they wouldn't do that. Having said that, <laughs> so I start writing about Scientology and, you know, at some point talking to you. My coverage predates the Tom Cruise events of, uh, you know, around War of the Worlds, where he went on Oprah and bounced up and down and seemed really manic. And, you know, he got into a conflict with Matt Lauer on, on the Today Show. And there was one after another. Around that time, Scientology folks turned up in my office and they were asking for me. I wasn't there as it happened. And they wanted to give me literature. And, you know, I think you called and my recollection is you started just talking about jobs I had had a long time ago to imply, I guess, that you guys had looked into me. I don't know. Do you think there's a dossier? I mean, is there, is there a file that says Kim Masters, bad person or, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely, <laughs> Kim. There, There is a file on everybody who has ever said or done something that Scientology disagrees with. And it's kept by the Office of Special Affairs 
which is the organization that I used to be in charge of and is really the successor to the Guardian's office, which was the organization that I had talked about previously, that Scientology then said, well, you know, we got rid of all those people. They were just a few bad apples, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> For the people the truth who persecuted of the, the reporters, yeah. <laughs> right. The, the truth of the matter, Kim, is that the people in the Guardian's office were following the directives of L. Ron Hubbard. And the directives of L. Ron Hubbard never change. So the people in the Office of Special Affairs, to this day, follow those same directives of L. Ron Hubbard. You can't change them. That fair gaming, you know, Scientology says, well, fair game no longer exists. Actually, what happened was like a year or so after he originally wrote this policy about fair game where it says, you know, enemies of Scientology can be tricked, sued, lied to. Sea Org members are supposed to find them and shoot them in the head. That <laughs> literally, he put out another directive and said, oh, we are canceling the use of the term fair game because it brings bad public relations. However, <laughs> we are not changing how we treat enemies of Scientology. But having said that, you know, I wrote quite a lot about Tom Cruise, I did a cover of a magazine in that period where he was, you know, getting so much attention for being so exuberant, <laughs> shall we say. And I mean, this was, uh, you know, post Nicole Kidman when he was with uh, Katie Holmes and War of the Worlds was happening. You were there for all of this. It must have been a horror show for you because you were supposed to, I imagine, manage some of the press and the press was going crazy. But there were stories in the past of fair gaming someone by, you know, this judge by maybe killing his dog. Maybe the dog just died. But, you know, I just went about my business and no one killed me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that there has ever been anybody that has been killed other than like the incidents like Lisa McPherson, where you have people who die because of lack of appropriate care, which is a different thing than, you know, going out and whacking a, a reporter like the guy in Las Vegas. So yeah. I talk about this in the book, Kim. Uh, you know, some of that I was around for. Some of it I was in the notorious hole for. You were being um, punished for your failings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was effectively being held prisoner with a lot of other people. And that was first really depicted in Going Clear, in Larry Wright's book and then Alex Gibney's wonderful documentary on HBO, which I still recommend to people to watch for the sort of easiest one and a half or two hour summary of the reality of Scientology that there is. Which you and I are both actually in, I should say. Yes, but, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot you were in it, but yes, yes exactly. I'm in it too. <laughs> I talk in the book about what happened that sort of led up to that insane period with Tom Cruise, both the efforts of David Miscavige to get him back on board because he had drifted sort of while shooting Eyes Wide Shut with Nicole and Stanley Kubrick. And then he was brought very much back into the fold to the point where he was basically persuaded that he should get rid of Pat Kingsley. His and publicist. He had one of the most, uh, you know, the greatest yes. in history, probably, <laughs> yeah. uh, publicist in Hollywood. And she was seeing this spin out happen and um, pushing back against certain things, I guess. And that was the end of that. She was quite right. You know, movie studios are paying a lot of money to produce a movie and they don't want their stars going out hogging the press uh, that's supposed to be covering the movie, talking about stuff that has nothing to do with the movie. So, you know, she was perfectly correct. I was sent to try and dissuade her from that position and failed. Now, was there a point in time when this was happening where Scientology was like, this is great. Tom is pushing the message. And then I don't know if you were there for this. Maybe you were only partly in the picture, you know, not in the whole. Was there a moment where they started thinking, you know, maybe this isn't so great for us? I don't think so. I mean, at least they never would have told Tom that because from the perspective of Scientology, that was the greatest era of dissemination of Scientology in its history in that. More people heard about Scientology because Tom Cruise was doing crazy stuff than 
had ever probably heard about it in a short period of time. They don't ever actually see what the real reaction is. They had just presented the, oh, look at this. Tom Cruise was on Oprah Winfrey, and Oprah Winfrey has an audience of, you know, 12 billion people, and Tom was talking about Scientology on there. The fact that everybody was laughing about him and he became a sort of a, a one of the first internet memes for jumping on the couch was not something that Scientologists ever focused on, nor would they ever focus on it. And his little spat with Matt Lauer from a Scientologist perspective, that was wonderful. He was saying exactly what every Scientologist believes. All psychiatric drugs are bad. I don't care about postpartum depression. I don't even care what drug it is. You, I know about it. You don't. You're ignorant. Blah, 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 blah. So from a Scientology perspective, that stuff was wonderful. And this is the problem that they have is they literally exist in a bubble. Coming up after the break, Mike Rinder details the close relationship between Tom Cruise and Scientology leader David Miscavige. You're listening to The Business from KCRW. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Shaka Tafara. Growing up a Jamaican kid in Venice Beach, it was important to my mom that we had a connection to Africa. But the concept of the motherland was hard to digest. Until I fell in love with LA's only African enclave, Little Ethiopia. Join me for an audio love letter to the neighborhood. Listen now to my two-part series at kcrw.com slash Little Ethiopia. This is The Business, and I'm Kim Masters. Former high-ranking Scientologist Mike Rinder has dedicated the past 15 years to speaking out against the organization. He appeared in Alex Gibney's 2015 HBO documentary, Going Clear, as did I, and co-hosted the A&E series, Leah Remini, Scientology and the Aftermath, for which he won an Emmy. He and Remini currently co-host the podcast Scientology Fair Game. He has now released a memoir, A Billion Years, My Escape from a Life in the Highest Ranks of Scientology. During his years in Scientology, Rinder dealt with a number of celebrities, including the organization's highest profile member. At one point, I said to Alex Gibney, who made Going Clear, and I was going to ask your perspective, that I did have some compassion for Tom Cruise. I mean, and you know that Tom Cruise is extremely high level, number two, I guess, in the organization at this point, at least in an honorary way. And that, you know, he has Scientology people working for him. You talk about this in your book, doing personal services extensively. You know, I mean, people have been put through things to make, you know, they were, there was a well-known story, I think, about how Tom Cruise mentioned that he had envisioned running through a field of wildflowers with Nicole Kidman and Scientology people out in the desert at the Gold facility were ordered to put that together, right? That was a right. that was a well-known, you know, and then I think it didn't work out and they were, it, the whole thing was just a wasted exercise in futility. Right. But I had said to Alex, you know, he's an actor who, whatever, you know, didn't have maybe an easy childhood. And Scientology, when you're dealing with the insecurity of somebody who's a star and may not understand fully why they're a star and may think that this helps them explain and control that, you know, if they do this right, that they get to keep that. I did feel some compassion for that. And Alex did not, <laughs> really, <laughs> I don't think. Hmm. Um, where do you come down on that question? Uh, I'm on the no compassion team. Mm -hmm. I, I, my view is that Tom Cruise has done an awful lot to promote Scientology to a lot of people. I mean, he has tried to get a lot of people into Scientology, not very successfully. You know, I talk about a bunch of them in the book from Ron Howard to Steven Spielberg to, you know, just people that he was dealing with in the industry. But worse than that, he has promoted Scientology as something that has been incredibly helpful to him. And there are a lot of people out in the world, as you know, who take the lead from movie stars about how they should live their life. And he has probably single-handedly resulted in more people getting involved in Scientology than any other single human being in the history of planet Earth. He has a responsibility for that. And he 
somewhat different than some of the other celebrities, is very, very well aware of many of the abuses that have taken place in Scientology because he is best buddy palsy Wellsy with David Miscavige. I mean, that article that was done by Kim Christensen in the LA Times, which was, I, I also talk about this in the book with the picture of Tom Cruise and David Miscavige sitting on their motorcycle, their Ducati motorcycles with their matching leather jackets. This was sort of the proof that these two are joined at the hip. This is not the Pope and Frank Sinatra. You know, <laughs> a lot of people like to make analogies about, oh, well, you know, Frank Sinatra was a Catholic or Sylvester Stallone's a Catholic. You know, you can't hold the abuses of the Catholic Church against them. Well, if they were hanging out in the Vatican with the Pope and had, you know, his personal phone number and they were talking every day and David Miscavige was reviewing the rushes of Tom Cruise's movies as they were being done and giving him direction on what to do with them. That is someone who understands and knows about the things and the attitudes and the behaviors that are ongoing in the inner sanctum of Scientology, i.e. the world of David Miscavige. I know you're focused on the Hollywood world. And of course. I hope that people don't get the impression that the book is merely a, you know, celebrity gossip. Oh, no, no. It, I can say that it is certainly not at all that. And obviously this show is a Hollywood show and the business of Hollywood. And I, it's been fascinating to me. But I felt from my point of view as a reporter covering this, from the time when there was no internet and I was dealing with people who were absolutely terrified to talk to me and, and, and going through all sorts of precautions to be sure that I wasn't a double agent. You know, and I, again, I was warned about people going through my trash and don't leave your dog in the yard and all this kind of stuff. To now where people whose names I never thought I would say out loud as early sources are public. Right. And I think the internet has had so much to do with it in that people could, first of all, all of this doctrine got posted online in, in a thing that was extremely, you know, all this stuff about the intergalactic warlord Xenu, stuff you're supposed to only learn if you go through all the classes and courses and up the bridge to total freedom. And <laughs> I'm spouting this stuff that I picked up. But, you know, that I think was probably pretty damaging. And then the community, which I think you're part of, of former Scientologists, where they people can support each other. I couldn't agree with you more, Kim. I think that the internet has had a huge impact on not just Scientology, but any organization that relies on keeping people in the dark, both those who are still within the organization and also those who are outside. Because as you say, it used to be very difficult to interact with anybody else who had left Scientology. How do you find them? You know, you couldn't just go onto Facebook and find the name of a person and see, oh, I didn't know that this person left or check and see if someone has left and then be able to reach out to them and send them a di direct message. So that has, has shifted the dynamic. It like sort of moved the balance of power. That and then, you know, the reporting by Larry Wright and the film by Alex Gibney changed things dramatically, in my view. That's true. Mike Rinder's memoir, A Billion Years, My Escape from a Life in the Highest Ranks of Scientology, is now available online and in bookstores. Thank you, Mike, for answering my burning questions. <laughs> I've been curious for a long time <laughs> about some of these things. Thanks, Kim. And that's The Business. Joshua Farnham produced and edited today's program with help this week from Matt Schwartz and Paul Smith, who mixed the show. You can stream The Business as well as other great KCRW podcasts on the KCRW app. I'm Kim Masters. We'll see you next week on The Business.